Okay, thank you, Abelardo, for introducing me. As you said, my name is uh, Maren Schaffel. I work at the Fraunhofer Fit in Germany, um, together with uh, Martin Wolkers, and I'm here now going to present some work that is uh, related to my PhD, um, and that I did uh, together with some colleagues and actually Abelardo's uh, research group in his university in Spain. Um, when you have courses at universities, you um, very often have, on the one hand, students that might get stuck or that have problems uh, or that don't know what to do, um, what materials to use, etc. On the other hand, you might have um, teachers that get frustrated because the students don't do what they want them to do or they just somehow don't get the results they thought, but they don't know why. So. Um, a solution somewhat to this would be that if teachers are aware of what the students are actually doing and not just the results the students turn in, but also the, the activities they do while interacting with the learning management system uh, or other material, etc., then the teachers um, could guide them better and see whether the students are on the wrong track or they could give them advice um, because maybe students have some problems but they couldn't really put them into concrete questions. But just for the teacher to know that there are problems could already be helpful, um, or general troubleshooting. So once the teachers have those information, they could also evaluate the course and could maybe then change their didactic concepts or um, change the materials, give other, give more videos, less videos, more text, etc., or just to repeat some content in a lecture uh, in the following week. Um, those. Um, uh, information about what students do could also um, give teachers information of which of the materials actually have been used. Maybe he put a lot of material online in the course, but students never use it, so he might as well just take it out or rethink. As I said, troubles that occur uh, can be spotted. Um, teachers could know when students actually start their work, um, whether they could maybe help them time manage better and uh, in what part of the course they get stuck and how do all teachers get this information would be monitoring. Um, those uh, monitoring observations, um, a lot of you probably know this is just to have log files. But if you have log files of interactions with, from the students with the management system, with any other kind of tool, you have like a huge list of things and you never know, okay, what is now the important part? What is actually that information out of this whole shebang that I really need? And um, how can this evaluate effective, effectively um, without having to look at all the information that is there? So what is needed is some form of data distillation um, so that anything that is irrele irrelevant is filtered out. And what we thought um, would be a useful thing to do is uh, to use uh, key action extraction or key action sequences extraction. Um, and we, that's our hypothesis, think that this is a useful form of data distillation. Um, well, you might wonder what are key actions? Um, as Abelardo said, and when he introduced me, I'm a computational ling linguist. So um, what I try to do here is that I apply methods that I usually use so text analysis in linguistics to now use them on log data. And key actions can somehow be seen as an analog thing to key words. And what are key words in, um, I'm not there, okay, sorry, wrong, wrong structure. But uh, yeah, here you have the overview. <laughs> um, I'm going to come to the linguistic uh, thing in a second. Yeah, here you have the overview. Um, about what data we collected, uh, then the linguistic theory, and I'm going to quickly explain the test bed that um, we had in Spain uh, and present some results of the key actions. Um, the, the data we extracted, uh, we stored them in the CAM format. I'm not going to explain this in detail now. If you have any questions, you can either come to me later or look it up online. Um, yeah, the linguistic background. Um, as I said, keywords in linguistics are that thing that kind of grab the essence of a text. If you know a text keyword, you basically know what the text is about. And um, it's not completely exhaustive. You might miss something. But still, like the essence of what the text is about and what is really significant you will get when you extract keywords. 
So what we now think is if you do the same with log data and you extract key actions, you might miss something, but still the basic stuff, the essence, that what was important for whatever time frame is analyzed, will be that. Um, might still, um, same with keywords, not be exhaustive, but it can get some sort of superficial impression of what is really going on. Um, the test bed um, we use is one in Spain at the Universidad Carlos de Cerro de Madrid, where Abelardo is. And we uh, analyzed log data from a C programming course that took place from September 5th until December 18th in 2011, so it's almost a year ago. Um, there were 332 students and we logged about 340 events for the whole year and we had 33 different event types. I'm not going to list them all, but just so you have a rough idea. Basically, you have things like logging in, logging out, compiling, um, debugging, etc. It's just several things. Um, the things we actually did log was, on the one hand, a virtual machine that was given to the students at the beginning of the semester. Uh, it was Linux-based, and it was given to the students, and it contained a text editor, um, a compiler, a debugger, etc., anything they would need to compile, and all those events were logged. Second, we had the learning management system, which in this case uh, was Moodle, I think, yeah, Moodle, and it was, um, those logs are, Moodle just logs all the time anyway, and those logs were extracted and added to the ones from the virtual machine. And we also had um, an Apache server with learning material, and those accesses there were also logged and um, put in this whole thing. The course was structured into five lecture groups, and uh, each of those five groups was again subdivided into two or three so-called lab groups. Here you have some overview of the events that were actually monitored. So we have web page accesses, when they actually compiled, um, when they started the text editor, when they closed it, when they debugged, when they used the profiler. In the course material that was offered on the server, um, there were also some um, quizzes that students could take and when it, they didn't have to, but it's just a way to, for them to see whether they understood the material. And um, they could um, do the yes or no button or click the right answer and they could also redo uh, the test or like have the results shown if they had got the wrong answer. Um, some descriptive statistics about the course. Um, we, uh, as you can see, that uh, the web page access was the event that was lost the highest, um, which is uh, quite understandable. And um, the colors are, I don't know whether you, yeah, whether you can read it, the, the red part is the second half of the course and um, the blue part is the first half. Um, we split it because in the first half of the course, students um, were programming teams of two. And in the second half, they have bigger groups of four or five with um, more um, actual compile exercises to do. And that's why we split it, just to information. And that's why you can see that, for example, in the first half, they did quite a number of quizzes. Um, that's the one here, the last blue part in the middle. And uh, in the second half, they hardly did any quizzes because they compiled much more, which you can see in the compile bar, which is the second one from the left. Um, here you have uh, uh, some overview of um, the activity compared to the group. We have, the, as I said, the five different groups and they are um, subdivided into lab groups. So you have all the different lab groups here. And um, we normalize the activity of those lab groups. So number, uh, average number of events, um, the uh, average number of assisted groups. And uh, as you can see, there are some groups that are quite active, especially the B2 group and some that are not. And we um, compared it to the group size. The group size is that green circle or that green line you can see there. And um, so what you can see is that um, those groups that are quite small had the highest activity. And those groups that are quite large or fairly large had quite a low activity. We didn't have any specific explanation for that, but it was just something interesting to see for the teachers that um, obviously group size um, matter in this in this case. Okay, now for the um, key actions. The algorithm used was a so-called n-gram algorithm. Does everyone know? Or does you want a quick explanation of what the yeah? Okay. Okay. 
So basically you have uh, a row of events, in this case this would, this would be the letter, and you have them in certain um, positions. So the, between 0 and 1 you have A, between 1 and 2 you have B, etc. And what you first do is just ex um, extract all monograms. So in this case these are all the A's, these are all the B's, C's, D's, etc. And then you try to combine those um, monograms into biograms. In this case, by the way, you need to test threshold is two, so no no monogram is picked out because everything occurred more than twice. So you diagram for everything, and then from here you see is there anything below the threshold, those you kick out. And then again, the remaining ones you try to combine into trigrams, etc., etc. Sorry, I can I can explain it in more detail if you want. But basically, what you have in the end, if you go through the whole thing, is that you have key actions remaining. In this case, D would be a key action and B, C, A, B. Which is to keep on compiling longer chains of, of, of events uh, until you, you cannot do it anymore and nothing gets kicked out at the threshold anymore. Um, so this is what uh, uh, this is what we did um, for the whole course. We analyzed the whole course. We also analyzed the theoretical units and the lab group and uh, some individual students. We had several granularity levels. So for some compilations, we took into account the tool they used, the actual events, so like open, write, close, etc. And the item they did it with, sometimes we only took the item into account just to have several comparisons and several levels of granularity because um, the less you take into account, the more can be combined, obviously. Um, we only took those actions into account that were longer than three because anything below that we thought would be not meaningful enough. And after we did the actions, we also used another uh, method that is often used in linguistics, uh, namely the TFIDF weighting. So um, term frequency, multiple accuracy, inverse document frequency. And we did this um, for uh, 10 most frequent actions. And uh, from the normal calculations, and we just suppose them to the 10 highest weighted actions. This is what um, the, visual, the visualization looks like, and uh, that we show to the teachers uh, at the end to uh, evaluate. The, the darker box is always the first part of the sequence, and then you have the other structures. Um, now for some of the results. Um, what we did is, we, as I said, we analyzed the whole course and some subgroups of that, and then we did this all after the whole course happened. So we didn't do it during the course, but after we had all data from the whole course, and when, then we showed it to all the different teachers that were, that were part of that course and asked them for their opinion whether they could actually deduce something from those key actions and what they could deduce. Because when we looked at them at the results for some things were very obvious for us, but because we weren't the teachers and we weren't involved in the course, some things were just, for us, basically got numbers. Like, yeah, it's nice to have, but what does it actually tell you? And the teachers could actually deduce something from them. For the quizzes, as I said, there were some quizzes in the material. First of all, the teachers thought it was a very good sign, sign that they actually showed up in the um, key actions at all, because they wanted to, to see whether students actually picked this up and used that offer of learning and, and reviewing. Um, um, what also showed up in the key actions is that very often what students had wrong answers, instead of trying again to get the right one from all the possible leads they had, they just clicked on show results. And the teachers um, thought that this would be a sign that students actually didn't grasp the topic really yet. But saw a question, put on some answer, it was wrong, and instead of trying to remember what the topic was about or what actually they were taught, they just didn't actually the result. Um, they also, um, the key actions about the quizzes also showed that where the problems actually were, so which topics students got most wrong answers, um, or, or which um, question, which kind of material questions were actually redone again and again and again. So this um, showed the teachers where they could, if it had been in a live analysis, where they could have stepped in during the semester and said, hey, look, I noticed that you had these problems during the quizzes. I'll explain again. And also what the teachers liked is that they compare, can compare the quiz use of the different groups. 
Um, we had one, one running of the analysis where when we, when we calculated all the key actions, we didn't take the, the, the name of the C file that students gave into account. We just said, okay, some C file was used so we could actually compile better um, extractions. And there, um, pretty long compilation chains came out of that, which was uh, something that the teachers liked a lot because then they could uh, see that students were actually um, compiling. And as this was an objective of the course to get students to learn how to program and see. Um, when looking at the different lecture groups and the different lab groups, um, some of the groups had quite long compilation chains and especially that the longest chain that was there was something that was connected to compile. But there were also some groups that their longest uh, chain uh, of key actions were connected to the browser or something else. And this is um, a sign for the teachers that those groups possibly might not have been engaged as tightly into the course as those where there was a huge compilation chain. And um, this again would be a sign for them that had they done the analysis during the course, they could have stepped in and said, hey, look, guys, stop driving. This is a compilation course. And what is your problem? I'll try to help you. Um, here you have another spider web of the compilation. As I said in the first half, it was only a team of two, and it was still the beginning and the explanation of how to uh, get started in programming C. So the blue part, which is the first part, is still there's not very many compilation um, events. Uh, in the second half, it's quite higher, and as you can see, that one group is very, very, very active. And it's also, as you could see in the first spider graph, uh, it was the smallest group, so it was just some students compared to some other courses where there were 20 or more. For the TFID weight, uh, um, extra uh, uh, algorithm results uh, we did for the lab groups, um, it was interesting to see for very many of the, um, of the lab group teachers um, what was specific for th their group, so which key actions were even more interesting or more more relevant for their group. And um, one teacher, for example, really liked that his course had a lot of memory profile usage and used the forum discussions to keep each other in, in, in track and discuss what they were doing. And um, um, also what was visible from, from the TFID rates in some courses was that students used a lot, like when there was one group that off, very often used the SDN material and uh, copied the command syntax. So instead of, by the end of the course, they should kind of know what they have to type in, but they just always copy it. So this is also a sign that teachers said, no, we should somehow in the next year get students to actually learn the, the syntax better. Um, we, what we also did was for individual students, we took, uh, because we did the analysis at the end of the year, those students with the 10 highest final marks and those with the 10 lowest final marks and compared to TFID rates of those. And the students with the high marks had very often um, compilation key actions or a memory profile of key actions. And they also checked the forum files often and discussed. Those students with low marks um, very often have text editor or, key, uh, or, or um, web browser key actions. And uh, they checked the course notes and not the forum as much. Um, another very interesting aspect that the teachers noticed is that, in general, those students that had good final marks checked the score sheet that was available. Um, so they were actually interested in seeing, okay, where am I? Where, what, what's the, the score so far? And those students um, with lower marks didn't. Um, in general, the teachers thought that those uh, analysis results where the TFID rating was added onto the, the normal engram algorithm, uh, algorithm was more interesting than the plain key actions, as they um, allowed to compare better that specific lab group or that specific theoretical um, lecture group to the whole of the course or to the other lab group. And um, yeah, that was uh, a fact they liked a lot. So as a conclusion, we could say those t-shirts um, we asked in Spain, uh, they thought that key actions are a useful form of data distillation. Um, they liked that they could uh, evaluate the course and could rethink of what they could change in their way of teaching or in their way of presenting the material. And uh, to give a quote, they said there were lots of eye-opening things in there. 
Um, the challenge we now face is, um, as I said, we did this after the course. We um, first did plan to actually implement it live during the, this semester, but there were some things that made this not possible. And so now the question is, um, will it be possible to actually analyze this during a course? So if you have any courses or if you have any idea where I could actually apply this live <laughs> in one of your courses, uh, let me know. And um, will it actually help the teachers to really um, change their behavior or is it just if you saw this now after the semester, I said, oh yeah, I could have stepped in this and this, but would they actually do this? If they get the results would they, during the semester, would they actually change their, their, their interaction with the students? Um, another challenge is how can we give this data also to the students? How can we give them the possibility to, to somehow learn this or can it, will it help them to self-regulate themselves or, or learn better? Um, another aspect is, um, can we um, also include other linguistic methodologies and um, to get some even further um, distilled data from this and um, maybe get like on an even higher level and abstract even more. And um, what would be a good gold standard to actually evaluate against? I mean, it's nice to have teachers say, yeah, it helps, but how do you actually can somehow evaluate the case? this is good or this is bad or um, is this the right way to do it. And these are the challenges I'm now um, facing and try to somehow solve so I can put this into um, my PhD. And uh, yeah, so if you have any answers to any of those questions, um, I'm more than happy that you come and talk to me. And uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs>